Welcome to The How of Business with your host, Henry Lopez, the podcast that helps you start, run, and grow your small business. And now, here is your host. Welcome to this episode of The How of Business. This is Henry Lopez, and my special guest today is Edricio de la Cruz. Edricio, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Henry, for having me. Really excited. Yes, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, we're going to chat about his entrepreneurial journey. And so it's an incredible journey from selling guavas in a barrio in Santo Domingo as a child to selling his startup to MasterCard in Silicon Valley. Edricio is with me today to share that inspirational entrepreneur, entrepreneur journey, experiences that he's had, tips and advice. And so it's a great story, and I'm excited to talk to him about it. To receive more information about the Howa business, including the show notes page of this episode, and how you can continue supporting my show and receive exclusive content and discounts through a Patreon membership, just visit thehowabusiness.com. I also encourage you to please subscribe wherever it is that you listen to this show so you don't miss any new episodes. So let me tell you a little bit more about Edricio. Edricio is a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and the first Latino Y Combinator visiting partner. He is most known for selling his fintech startup Arcus to MasterCard's in its first Latin American acquisition for MasterCard. In 2013, Enricio founded Arcos, a payments as a service platform. He secured $19 million in funding from Y Combinator, Ignea, SoftBank, and City Ventures, and grew that company to 100 plus employees and 100 plus clients, including, including companies like Walmart, 7-Eleven, Santander, BBVA, Rappi, and uh, and before he sold it, as I mentioned, in 2021. Edricio lives in Miami, Florida, back in my hometown area. I grew up in Hialeah, as many of my listeners probably know. And so once again, Edricio de la Cruz, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Henry. Really excited to chat. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as I mentioned in the opening, an, an incredibly varied and 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 journey, which is, you know, of course, not uncommon to a lot of immigrants or children of immigrants as you are and as I was. But uh, tell me a little bit about that story. As I did the research, you you started out or were starting out as an aircraft technician and then made the shift to investment banking. So that's quite a transition. Uh, and then now you're you're a uh, visiting partner, as I mentioned, at Y Incubator. But tell me about those early days and what you were doing then and how you made that transition. Yeah, certainly, Harry. Uh, so I grew up in Santo Domingo uh, with my mom and my brother. Um, my dad lived in the States while he would send money back home uh, to help us make ends meet. Uh, when I was 11 years old, uh, I started selling guayabas in Santo Domingo to help my mother. Uh, a year later, we wind up immigrating from Santo Domingo to the South Bronx, and then Harlem. Um, when I got to high school, I really wanted a way to kind of escape my circumstances. So I almost symbolically chose to join the U.S. Air Force and become a fighter pilot. And at the same time, started college, started college of aeronautics. Uh, I did that for about a year until duty called, and I had to kind of drop out of both college and the Air Force uh, to become an airplane mechanic, again, to help my parents make ends meet. So, I, so at age 18, I got dropped out of college, dropped out of the Air Force, and I became a full-time aircraft mechanic. And I did that for about six years. How were you able to get out of the Air Force that way? Well, I was in ROTC. ROTC ah, is a program that, yeah, exactly, that works in conjunction with school. So if you sure. drop out of school, you automatically drop out of the program. Got it. You had not formally enlisted yet. You were in the ROTC program on your way exactly. to enlisting, yep. Exactly, exactly. Um, so once I dropped out and, and had worked as an aircraft mechanic at JFK for a number of years, uh, just a few things just dawned on me. You know, I, I, I felt like I was complacent. I felt like I wasn't really fulfilling the social contract that my parents and I had, meaning when they made the sacrifice to come over and leave the Dominican Republic to bring me over, I feel like the implicit promise was for me to live a better life than they did. So I felt like an impetus for action. I needed to do something much bigger than become an aircraft mechanic, which is a good living, sure. but it wasn't what it wasn't enough for me and for my parents did. So I decided to go back to college. Is no that what they wanted for you primarily is for you to go get a formal education? 
Yeah, more than that, I think they wanted me to succeed and really fill out my potential implicitly, right? Uh, they haven't they hadn't attended college in the states, uh, but I think implicitly every immigrant parent uh, wants the kid to fulfill their potential. So I wanted to kind of do good by that kind of implicit promise that I had made them. So I decided to go back to college uh, at 22, <laughs> when <laughs> most people are graduating college. Uh, no school would take me. I wound up going to community college for two years, then then transferred to city college at 24. I wound up graduating at 25, 26. So it wound up taking me eight years to get a four year degree. Yeah. Uh, and and, and so I you did that at night and weekends, perhaps yep. as you were working during the day. Yeah. Yep. I would work nights and weekends and holidays as an aircraft mechanic, and during the day I would uh, attend. City College. And what did you major in? What did you study? I initially studied as a computer science major, and then I switched to, to finance because I wanted to, to work on Wall Street. Uh, my, my dream was to, to be uh, an investment banker at the time. Um, I, I was enamored with the success that I saw on Wall Street, and I wanted to be become the best uh, by being part of the best at the time. So, um, And at the beginning, it was really tough because uh, no bank would take a chance on me. Uh, I, I went to 33 different interviews and we got 33 no's until I, I got that opportunity to to do one internship uh, at UBS. And that changed my life because once I got that interview, once I got that internship, going from a you know a blue collar, a blue collar kind of overall to wearing a Brooks Brothers suits changes your outlook on life. Of course. You know, you should, you change your setting, you change your outlook, you change your attitude. And it started making me believe in myself that I could do much more. So after that, I, I got a full-time job as an investment banker at J.P. Morgan, did that for a couple of years, noticed that a lot of my classmates were, uh, a lot of my colleagues were, were had come from Ivy League schools. I have come from the opposite of that, of course, mm -hmm. but uh, I believe that I could make it. Uh, I, I applied to a lot of schools. I didn't have the best GMAT score. I actually had a quite a low score, but that didn't stop me from applying because uh, I, I decided to kind of lead with my story as opposed to lead with standardized tests, which I don't think says a lot about you. By your story, it says everything about you. And lo and behold, I got an opportunity to, uh, to attend the Wharton School, which, again, changed my life radically and dramatically after two years. That's where you got your MBA, right? That's correct, yeah. Did you did you stop working, or was this an executive MBA? How, did you take time off, or how did you do the MBA? Yeah, for the first time when I, ever I stopped working. I have been okay. working since I was 11. So you had you put yourself in a financial position where you could afford to go full-time to get your MBA? Yes, I, I just took a lot of loans. Okay, <laughs> yeah, okay. <it> was <laughs> I just took a lot of loans, yeah. Got it. I, I want to go back to when you got that internship with UBS. What, what do you think it is that they saw in you that led them to offer you that opportunity? That's a great question. Uh, I remember I got, I got the call on a Friday, and the interview was on a Monday. But I have been preparing for that interview for months. Really, my entire life, I felt like my life depended on it. I felt like that was my last chance to make it. And I was so prepared, Henry. Uh, I had been reading the Wall Street Journal. I've been reading books about being a banker. I've been talking to bankers. I've been interviewing them. I've been talking to them, understanding their mindset. And, and granted, I did not have the polish that the typical banker has. I did not speak like the typical banker. I was a Dominican kid from the hood. I, I spoke with an accent. I spoke with the mannerisms that a Dominican kid from a particular environment would sound like. But lo and behold, I think they were able to see that and still see a, the hunger, the degree of preparation and degree of intellect that I had in spite of those circumstances. Mm -hmm. So after four interviews, they gave me the opportunity like almost on the spot that, that same afternoon. That's fantastic. Okay. So you go and you get the MBA and then you went back into the finance industry after that, or what did you do after that? And back into investment banking, or where did you go? No, I, I received an offer to to go back to investment banking at Goldman Sachs. But after getting my MBA, I just felt so empowered. I felt like I had a degree of conviction in myself. I mean, just five years earlier, I had been kind of threading water, barely making it. Um, I, I felt like in just five years, I'd gone from a you know, someone finishing college, fish out of water to someone that was graduating from the top business school in the world. And I felt a lot of confidence. And one of the things I've always wanted to do was to be an entrepreneur. 
And at the time, becoming a tech entrepreneur was not as popular as it is now. But I wanted to build a business. And I learned that the best way to, to build a business is to starting with a problem that you know intimately. And for, for me, that business was around remittances. I had grown up receiving remittances in Santo Domingo. Then as an immigrant, I had sent remittances for a number of years. So I, I knew that problem intimately, and it was a broken system that had not evolved at all. Sending so, remittances, usually like sending money back to your country. Is that what we're talking correct. about? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Western Union, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that that was an, an area or a problem you saw that was broken, in your opinion. Uh, but let me go back to this desire to be your own boss. Was that there from the early days, even before you went to school? Was that an aspiration that you had, or do you remember? I had the desire to be entrepreneurial uh, from very early. Like I said before, I, I I joke around that my first startup was selling guayabas in San mm-hmm, Domingo. Sure, yeah. Um, but I never had the confidence or the structure to to the right launching pad because I didn't have that access. I, you know, it's yeah. really hard to be where you can't see. Right. So when you grow up in an environment of scarcity, as I did, uh, you you are not put in, not put in a position where you actually believe you can do that because no one around me was doing it. You know, not my family, not my friends, not my teachers. The people that I would see be entrepreneurs were people that did not look like me, the people that I saw on TV. But after business school, I felt a huge degree of conviction that I could do it. It empowered you. Definitely. Absolutely. When, let me just take a step forward here now to years later. When was it? When did you graduate from the Wharton School with your MBA? What year we're talking about? Uh, 2011. Okay. So from now to then, successful business venture, having sold it. Looking back, do you think you still uh, apply what you learned in business school? I apply a lot of aspects. I had to unlearn some. Okay. So yeah, in terms of the, the aspects that I apply that are are definitely uh, relatable, uh, definitely you know how to think about markets, how to think about customers, how to th- how to think about building a team, how to think about you know sales and P and L. I think those aspects are very valuable and definitely relatable. Obviously, having gone to a business school of that stature gives you a lot of soft skills and and hard skills that are just very applicable and very useful at at a startup. Has it proven uh, from a networking perspective to be valuable at this point? Did did you, are you able to leverage that as well? Absolutely. And I think it gives you a degree of credibility amongst the investor investment community. Okay. That you are someone that that's been in an environment of excellence, that so you, you can. And obviously, you know, there are a lot of things that you have to unlearn because the way that big companies work, uh, or the way schools work, it, it works within a structure environment. You think differently when you are in a structure environment where your uh, modus operandi is more around getting consensus from your peers, mm-hmm. doing things structurally, doing things with a little bit more degree of conviction, startups really just value speed and efficiency. So I had to unlearn a lot of things from being an MBA to be an entrepreneur. It took me actually a couple of years. And when I got, you know, in 2013, we we were running out of money, applied to Y Combinator and got into Y Combinator that ultimately is the the biggest successful, the most successful startup incubator in the world at that time already. That's when we really were able to kind of learn, okay, this is the MBA, but for founders. Yeah. Okay. So uh, after the MBA, it certainly gives you that confidence, that courage to go and try something. You identify a problem. Is that what Arcus, Arcus, am I pronouncing it right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Arcus. Is that what what you did next is start that venture? Yes. uh, Initially, it wasn't called Arcus. It was called Regali. Okay. Uh, and we went through many changes, uh, many pivots of the idea. I see. So the, initially, the, the premise was, we're going to change remittances. Instead of sending cash, you're going to pay your family's bills back home. That was the initial kind of premise. We, we wound up pivoting that business several times to what mm-hmm. ultimately became Marcus. And, but, but thanks to the education that we got uh, at Y Combinator, which was yet another environment of excellence, we were able to get through those pivots much quicker yeah. or quick enough that we didn't run out of money, survive, and ultimately thrive. 
So 2013, you started. When did you get accepted into Y Combinator? When did they make the investment? In 2013. 2013 that, okay, so in that same year. year. Okay, all right. So yeah. shortly thereafter. Why? Looking back, what do you think was some of the key components or the key thing that they saw in you and in and the business that accepted them and made the investment? What do you think it was that they saw? It's a good question. I, I think they probably saw a lot of what UBS saw uh, just eight years earlier, right? Uh, and that was uh, a huge degree of conviction, passion, and just relentlessness of this person is going to walk through walls to make it happen. This person is going to do whatever it takes to push through and make it happen. And I was there with my whole team. It was four of us at the time. And I think the team was also a big factor. We had an amazing group of people, people from, I worked at Lehman, another group, another colleague went, was, went to Penn with me, another colleague went, was an engineer at Google. So that was a big aspect. But I think investors always look to the leader and they always ask themselves, is this person someone that's going to attract more capital, attract more funds, attract more employees, media, press? Those are resources that you need uh, as a CEO. And when things get tough, because they will, is this a person that's going to push through, break through walls and keep going. And, and I think thankfully that that became evident. And I think that's part of the reason yeah, we got accepted. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. This is Henry Lopez with a brief break from this episode to share a special offer from our new show sponsor, Relay. Relay is an online banking and money management platform for a small business. As a small business owner, you need banking that's truly built for your small business. No more fees, no minimum balances, no more bookkeeping problems come tax season, and no more branch visits to complete basic banking tasks. Now you can take control of your money with Relay, an online banking and money management platform that puts you in complete control of your cash flow. First, there are no account fees, no overdraft fees and no minimum balances, which means you get to keep more of your hard-earned money. And Relay is the official banking partner for Profit First, so you can set up multiple checking and savings accounts and automate their percentage-based allocations using smart transfer rules. Relay also allows you to make unlimited payments via ACH, wires, or checks, earn interest on every spare dollar with Relay savings accounts, provide secure read-only access to your accountant and bookkeeper, and speed up bookkeeping with reliable bank feeds that sync directly into QuickBooks Online and Xero. Best of all, it takes less than 10 minutes to apply online and it's absolutely free. And as a special offer to the How a Business listeners, sign up for Relay using the link on the show notes page for this episode and you'll also get $50 added to your account once you fund your new account. You can find the link to the show notes page in the description for this episode. Relay customer deposits are FDIC insured through their partner bank, Thread Bank, member FDIC. Please see the show notes page for this episode at thehowabusiness.com for more details. So they help you with getting it launched. You find the right solution to focus on. You're highly successful, as I said. I'm assuming... Uh, um, before you sold it, that it was profitable. Is that correct? The business was generating a profit? No, no, no. Okay. no most startups are not profitable. Uh, okay. So do. by the time you get to selling it, you had not yet generated a profit, but obviously uh, MasterCard saw the value and did they approach you or is that part of, was that the exit strategy all along to some extent if the right opportunity came along? What, what, what was the thought? Yeah, typically the, the, the way it works is that uh, the way you meet you know, acquirers is organically through business development relationships. So ours was no different. So we, we had the fintech world is actually relatively small. And in Latin America, it's even smaller. We had been in Latin America for a number of years. We had developed at that time what became the largest you know, payment infrastructure for bill payments technology uh, in Mexico at that time. So they, they knew of us, obviously. So through business relationship conversations that they knew of us and what started as informal conversations became more serious over time and, and ultimately led to um, an acquisition in 2021. Why did you decide, or you and the team, and I'm sure you know whoever else had a, an interest in it from an equity partner perspective, why did you sell? 
a lot of different factors, uh, I, I think, push a, uh, a founder to sell. One of them, and in some cases, sometimes the founder is just running out of options. In our case, we had lots of options. We, we actually had just raised a round, so that wasn't the case for us. For us, it was uh, right time, right place, uh, and right partner. So MasterCard, Global Network, one of the biggest financial services company in the world, they were their strategy was squarely aligned with ours. And and for us, you know, we have been at it, you know, seven, eight years. That's the average age of a startup where we had corona to you now millions of dollars in revenue. It was sizable. Uh, we felt like it was the perfect time to to exit. Because if you don't exit, then what you're signing up for is you're not exiting to build this bigger. That's what you're signing up for. Right. And and what we saw is like the way to get bigger quicker, it's to partner with them. And at the same time, make, you know, have a, a fantastic outcome, which which we wound up having. We're very lucky in 2021, uh, which serendipitously wound up being kind of a great call because okay. the market in 2022 wasn't that friendly. Right, right. No doubt. So did you stay on for a transition period or did you exit right away? How did that work? Yeah, I stayed on for a little bit. Typically, uh, a founder stays on for a little bit as a handoff process. And then after a few months, I, I wound up leaving. Got it. Okay. Thanks for sharing that journey with us. Very interesting. Very, very lots to learn there. So thanks for walking me through that question. I want to go back to your parents' impression. What What did they think and say to you when you told them, I'm going to go start a venture. I'm not going to go back into a job. What were their thoughts? They've always been super, super supportive of everything that I did. Even, even when I, you know, decided to go to the Air Force and when I decided to become a mechanic and when I decided to go to Wall Street, they've always been super supportive. My dad, especially. Like I, I didn't live my dad until I was 11, but you know, I think he's always been supportive of my career. He's always does research on, on what I'm doing. Even though it's don't fully understand it, uh, I've been blessed to have parents that always supported you know, whatever endeavor I follow. Do you feel like now you are fulfilling that aspiration that they had for you, making the sacrifice that they made to come to this country? Uh, yeah, definitely. And I, I think I talk a lot about this in, in my social media, about the, the evolution of a social contract that you have as your feel. You know, I always say that you need to find your feel in order to figure out what drives you, because that's going to be the only constant. You know, ideas are going to change, marks are going to change, but your feel doesn't. For the feel for me was that that social contract that I had with my parents early on, but then that evolved to kind of being a social contract I had with my community. And that's the reason why I needed to succeed as a founder. But now it's kind of a social contract with, with society, right? Now I have to kind of continue to grow and and be representative of of of, of the society around people of color that want to succeed, you know, because it's hard to be what you can't see. So it's my job to be out there as a spokesperson for it, for that community. Yeah. And this is, I'm assuming, what has led you to your new book, Underdog Founder, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Uh, I spent uh, about a decade transcribing and journaling notes from every single experience that I had. As is that a right? That's something you, you've done for a long time, it sounds like? Yeah. I used to write journal entries uh, as a way to complain because I didn't want to complain <laughs> publicly. But you let uh, it out by, by putting it to writing. Yes. Yes. And I used it to write a book because I've, I've read lots of books about startups. I've read lots of books about diversity, but there's never been a book about startups made for people of color by a person of color. Okay. So and that's the focus is, is to specifically, obviously anybody could read it and take value from it, but that's who you're speaking to. Yeah. I'm speaking to the underdog father that feels like she or he is not seen by Silicon Valley. And I'm letting that person know how to, that that person is seen and how to weaponize their differences into opportunities so they can win. You talk about, you know, the the underdog founders and that being a big part of the future of entrepreneurship. And 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 I agree with you if I understand it correctly. I'll ask you the question here in a moment, but but I see that the, you know, this is something we've seen repeated, right? As immigrant populations in particular, as immigrants come to this country, they come with, as you very eloquently articulated, this drive, this desire, this fuel, as you said, to achieve. And that's been a part of what has made this country so entrepreneurial is, but what do you mean by the, by underdog founders and why do they end up being 
or can be highly successful in entrepreneurship? Yes. And so by underdog, uh, first I'll say what, what my point of reference is, then I'll expand it. So my point of reference obviously is, is uh, as a person of color, uh, black or Hispanic, having grown up in inner city, uh, New York City. So that, that's definitely my perspective. But I, I've come to embrace the fact that underdog can mean different things to different people. To me, is anyone that feels unseen, that feels marginalized, that feels like, and specifically in Silicon Valley, which is unlike academia, unlike corporate America, that has institutionalized diversity. You know, there's, there's diversity programs at, at corporations and schools. Silicon Valley does not have any of that. Yeah, you shared so, a statistic, uh, and, and I'm, you know, I'm sure there's different sources for this, but about only le- or less than two percent of venture capital invested in Silicon Valley is with African American or Hispanic found say Hispanic founders, right? That's correct. That's correct. So because a lot of these folks don't feel seen, and I felt like, how do how do I transcribe everything I've learned, the unwritten rules of how to be a person of color and not only to make it to Silicon Valley, but actually win big. And that's the purpose of the book, the playbook and, for the dark horse. And you share those key principles. Share with me just one of those, just as a preview of the book. What, what's what's one of those key principles that you're helping others with that do help you be seen uh, from that perspective? What's one of those principles? Sure. Uh, so so I think one of the ones that's very applicable specifically to to underdog founders is, is becoming the chief. And, and by that, I mean- Becoming is, the chief. Exactly. Becoming the chief to me being somebody that's formidable, somebody that demonstrates conviction, not only in their idea and their product, but in themselves. I noticed that a common pattern amongst underrepresented founders is that they feel like they need to ask for permission instead of asking for forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think good founders typically are like hungry caged animals where they just pounce on every single opportunity and they don't ask for permission, they just take it. Because as a founder, you're constantly breaking rules, you're hacking systems, you're talking to people, talking to customers and iterating your product. And sometimes to, to do that, you need to break some rules, not the law, but the rules. Mm-hmm. And a lot of founders of color, for, for correct reasons, right? For systemic reasons, don't feel that confidence, that don't feel like a conquistador. They so give, like me, the give me an example of what we're talking about there, that a founder should not follow, you know, either the norms or the rules that society mm-hmm. sets for us. What's an example of that? Yeah. So, so typically uh, when a founder wants to, uh, for example, uh, test an idea, I, I think one, one thing I've seen a lot from founders of color is that they try to follow every rule possible. Uh, I mean, you say, they say to themselves, it's like, well, I need to build the product first. I need to, uh, if, if I'm representing a, a brand, I need to get a, a partnership with that brand. And then I can go talk to customers at, when I have the product and I have the partnership with that Almost brand. Almost like I need that association to give me yes. credibility before I can go do it on my own. Exactly. And the good founder will say, well, F that. I don't need a partnership with that brand. I can just say I have it. Mm-hmm. I don't need the product. I can pretend that I have I can put up a website and mm-hmm. say that I have it. All I need is that I need a, a, a way to talk to the customers once I show them that I have a version of what they need. Not a perfect version, just a version of what they need. And that's a way to start accelerating and going through the ideation cycle much quicker without asking for permission for all these entities. Like, oh, I need permission from Apple. I need permission from this entity. I need permission... It's like that we have in in us kind of ingrained, indoctrinized that we need permission. Mm-hmm. Where a lot of what makes successful founders successful is that they feel like they have conviction in themselves and they believe that they can get that permission all to them. Got it. Okay. And, and the, you know, the beauty of the environment that we happen to live in, despite its prejudices, despite its disadvantages if we can get through and communicate the value that we're offering and there's really value there and somebody's willing to pay for it, we can make it happen. Can't we? Exactly. Exactly. All right. Let me take a slight shift. Other lessons that you've learned. Um, 
you you talk also about why startups fail in your observation in particular you know fa- founded by by um, by african americans and hispanics but what are some of the other common things that you observe that lead to failure in a startup well startups win for different reasons but they all fail for the same reason that's because they don't get to product market fit they can't build something that people want and and there's many things many miscalculated steps that lead them to that and in the book then the upon that I talk about a lot of those aspects a lot of those things that I made mistakes as a CEO so one of those mistakes and one of the most common ones is that they try to build too many things at the same time mm-hmm. so one of the chapters that I have or one of the principles that I have is called nail one thing at a time and that's exactly the opposite of what I did for many years is that we we try to nail many things at the same time. And why that is that? Be, were you were you trying to satisfy as many people as possible? Were you trying to reach a broader market? What why do you think you made that mistake? Yeah, as founders, and I talk about this in the book, uh, we, we have this notion of the hedge policy, meaning if we have more products in more markets, we're hedging our bets. I see. But what that winds up happening is because as a founder, a startup, you have so many limited resources. Yeah. Yeah. You end up diluting instead of hedging anything, right? Exactly. You end up diluting instead of hedging. Mm -hmm. So you move a lot slower, you learn a lot less, and you wind up actually further back than when you were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Instead of niching down, focusing, hyper-focusing, and getting that right first is what you're saying, I think. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So once you launch something, you nail that and it could be, you can nail the product or not, but at least you got a lesson from it and then you can iterate on the next version. Mm-hmm. You cannot do that if you're launching multiple products at the same time. It's yeah. very hard to do. Yeah. It's a big, it's a big lesson. Adricio. Thanks for sharing that because for small business owners in particular, you know, not Silicon Valley, not, not venture funded, we have very limited resources. And so we have to be very careful that we don't try to do and be everything to everybody. We can't. We can't afford that. Exactly. Exactly. You you'll save a lot more time and energy by being experimental and being selective with how you allocate resources. Yep. When someone asks you now, as I'm sure they often do, how do I become like you? How do I become an entrepreneur? What do you recommend typically as to where they start? Yeah, it's a great question. So the, the opening chapter in the book uh, talks about finding your fuel. And, and the reason why that's important is because I regard your fuel, your core drive, the thing that drives you towards your purpose and your passion are, are the only constant. Uh, you know, as a, as a founder, you know, your idea is going to change. Your products are going to change. Even your market, even your team may change. But your fuel is the one thing that's going to stay with you through thick and thin, through ups and downs, and there will be lots more downs than ups. So uh, the example that I cite uh, in, in my book as my fuel, it was that social contract that I built with my parents. And and having gone through everything I did from you know immigrating to, to Harlem all the way through getting my college degree and getting into business school, I felt like I had to develop a very a sense of indebtedness towards my parents. And because of that, I needed to win. Uh, you just need to find what that fuel is for you. Yeah. Uh, you definitely need to find it because you will need it. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. It's that why, that vision, what's driving you. What, what What's your fuel now? What drives you now? Yeah, I, I think my social contract has expanded since uh, I was able to, to sell the company uh, beyond my community and into society. I feel like, look, I, I feel like that tech is the ultimate equalizer. I, I think it can bridge the disparity across racial and socioeconomic classes. And, and I'll for example, like I, I went from living on welfare to now being wealthy in a matter of a decade and a half. And that's a lot thanks to tech. And that's why I wrote the book, because I want to open up those, not only the doors, but I want to give a, a path and a guide to people that look like me that don't have that access. So all I'm trying to do is try to get the word out to help more people get to where I am today. 
So tell me the the website that you have where I can learn more about you, your blog, where you share a lot of advice, and of course, then the new book. Where do we go for that? Uh, yeah, it's uh, edriciodelacruz.com. Pretty simple, right? <laughs> I'm glad yes. you were able to get that domain, and we'll have that edriciodelacruz.com. We'll have a link to that on the show notes page to this episode as well. So if you're not where you can write that down, I'll have a link to that as well. And there I can find your blog and I'll find more information about the book, right? That's right. You got it. The book again is is entitled Underdog Founder. And so check that out. A great inspirational book. Speaking of books, Adricio, is there another book that comes to mind that you would recommend? Absolutely. Uh, right before we we exited, you know, it, we were going through a very tough process. You know, we're in the middle of the pandemic. Personally, I was going through a lot. Uh, I lost my grandmother. My wife and I tried to have a baby, and we lost it. Oh, uh, I lost, terrible. yeah, yeah. It was in a very tough spot in my life, uh, mm-hmm. personally. Uh, and um, I talked to my therapist, and she recommended a book. Uh, that book was uh, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, uh, and and those are kind of the journalistic writings from. Um, a Roman emperor in the middle of war, which is exactly how I felt. And he didn't mean it to be a book. It's over a thousand years old. And he's just expressing the way he handled extreme obstacles in a very non-combative, constructive way. And that completely shifted my mindset from feeling bad and in terror about my circumstances to kind of weaponizing my circumstances and using them as fuel to prepare me forward and ultimately executing what became, you know, the sale to MasterCard. Excellent. Excellent. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing that and for sharing that recommendation. I appreciate that. All right. We'll wrap it up, Adricio. What, uh, what's, what's one thing you want us to take away from this conversation we've had about entrepreneurship, especially for minority founders underprivileged founders, what's one thing you want us to take away as a source of inspiration, if nothing else, from the conversation that we've had? Yes, uh, I think the obstacle is the way. I think look, we're all faced with lots of obstacles, lots of challenges. I think we have two choices. We can either dwell on those obstacles and ruminate in them, or we can weaponize them and use them to propel us forward, which is exactly what the spirit of the entire book is. And The Obstacle is the Way is another great book, which I suspect you've read, yes? Yes. Yes. Brian Holiday. Great Excellent. Book. Excellent. Tell us again, the, the website to go to learn more about you, the blog and the book underdog founder. Yes. Uh, you can go to Edricio de la Cruz.com. Excellent. Edricio, this has been a, a great conversation. Inspirational. Congratulations on all the success that you have worked hard to achieve. Thanks for sharing that journey with us and for being with me today. Thank you so much, Henry. This is great. We appreciate it. Thank you. This is Henry Lopez, and thanks for joining me on this episode of The How of Business. My guest today, again, was Edricio de la Cruz. I release new episodes every Monday morning, and you can listen and subscribe to my show anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and at my website, thehowofbusiness.com. Thanks again for listening. Thank you for listening to The How of Business. For more information about our coaching programs, online courses, show notes pages, links, and other resources, please visit thehowofbusiness.com.